Right, I think we can start again. Um, we only have one talk between, uh, before lunch today, and I've got a very brave <laughs> student here, Aya, who's going to basically help me because um, the lady who was supposed to, uh, from the Philippines, Laura David, who was going to talk about the implementation of sustainable livelihood analysis in the Philippines, couldn't make it. But when I found out that Aya was, in fact, one of her students, I asked if she would be willing to help give the presentation about the Philippines, because I personally am happy to give Laura's presentation, but I know nothing about the Philippines. So I asked Aya, and she agreed. So give her a lot of... Um, um, appreciation, <laughs> um, because she's had a total of two days to first of all look at the presentation and then we've had to cut it down a little bit because it was a long presentation so I have to apologise to Laura that we've had to do that but the full presentation will be available for you. So what I'll do is I'll just set the scene um, at a higher level for um, Aya's presentation of Laura's information which is a, a, a nice case study about sustainable livelihood analysis in the Philippines. So, my, so I've basically cut mine short to allow for Aya to do this. Um, so to give an overview again, I'm going to basically give you a, a sort of a, an argument as to why we need to look at these artisanal fisheries in developing countries, why they're really important. And I want to start off by basically just reiterating the fact that what we've seen already is that marine catches of um, food, uh, uh, fish for food has been levelling off or decreasing. But if we look at the overall food production globally, there's actually a small increase, and that's because of aquaculture. Now, surprisingly, or maybe unsurprisingly for some people here, most of that aquaculture comes from China. So if we didn't have China in the equation, we would be doing this. We wouldn't be growing the fish production. However, because we do have China in the equation, this is the aquaculture production increase in China. So China is responsible for a lot of the fish for food, basically. This is per capita, actually. Sorry, yeah, per capita food production. So, yeah, so China is, sorry, is it Rashid? But living in absolute numbers, it's about 70% of global production by China. Yeah, it's huge, yeah. So, and when, when I think of aquaculture, I think of things that take place in the ocean, a lot of like salmon production, uh, oysters, mussels, etc. Mm -hmm. But a lot of this is actually on land. It's not actually in the sea. Wrong computer. Right. So here I took some photos off the internet of some of the aquaculture production in China. And so basically what we're seeing is more aquaculture globally, but especially in China, and less wild caught fish per capita globally. So in terms of, I'm, I'm now just going to focus on the wild catches. So in terms of wild fisheries, we have this is a, a gross simplification, as a lot of these things are, but we basically have an artisanal fishery and then we have a, a larger scale, scale fishery. Now, I've called that industrial fishery, which is a little bit incorrect, but you know what I mean. So the artisanal fishery, what exactly is that? The FAO defines it as traditional fisheries that fish for their own households, but also to sell on the market. But basically the most defining factor of an artisanal fishery is that it's small scale, it's not industrial. So it's not necessarily only for own consumption, it, can, it is also commercial. So I've got three slides, and the first slides is from a study in 1980. And it compares large scale fisheries with small scale fisheries. Now, when I first started, yeah. When we talk about the total fish catch that FAO has or anyone, does it uh, combine both the artisanal, artisanal and the large scale fishery? I will show you. It 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 does. It's the it's the global catch. Mm -hmm. Obviously, artisanal fishery is sometimes a little bit more difficult to account for exactly how much of it's taking place, but it's global catch. Yeah. So it includes um, 
all fisheries. So when I first started looking at this, I thought, well, small-scale fisheries, they probably produce a lot less fish than the larger-scale fisheries. Well, that's completely incorrect. Because if we look at um, the marine fish that are caught for human consumption, there's a little bit less, I mean, this, this says 24 million tonnes in 1980, and this says 20 million tonnes in um, 1980. So there's a bit less from the attritional fishery, but not that much less. But if you look at the number of fishermen employed, obviously there's a lot more people employed in artisanal fisheries than in large-scale companies. Um, the capital per job is much less in artisanal fisheries. And some of these other indicators are interesting too, like fuel and oil consumption. In terms of the footprint of some of the fisheries, although there's a lot of aspects to that, this is again a gross generalisation, you can see that the footprint of the artisanal fish fishery is quite a lot less than the large-scale companies, even though they catch about the same amount. So this is 1980. So a couple of studies have been done since then, in um, the last one in 2006. So we would think that things might change over time since 1980. Whereas, in fact, if we think about the total amount that's caught for human consumption, it's still about the same. So there's still about the same caught by the small fishermen and the, and the large-scale fisheries. In terms of all the other indicators, in terms of the number of people employed in the respective size categories, in fact, the artisanal fishery now employs a little bit more. But, I mean, these are, again, global figures, so there's probably some inaccuracies in that. The fuel consumption is still less, also an order of magnitude, and... Um, Discards is one in here that wasn't in the previous one. The discards, which is a, is, is a global problem, is much, much less in the artisanal fishery than it is in the industrial fishery. So that's the global picture. Now, if you just want to look at the artisanal versus the large-scale fisheries in the developing nations, so here we're thinking about nations that aren't as wealthy as, as the global average, um, and there was a case study done in 2009 that took um, these countries listed on the right and again compared the large versus the small scale. The small scales on the left-hand side here, again, the number of fishermen is still significantly larger in the developing countries only. The two indicators that weren't in the last two slides is, this one is really interesting in my mind, the number of women employed in the fishing industry in the small and the large scale. There's 10 times more women employed in the small scale industry than in the large scale industry. Similarly, in the post-harvest um, side of things, 16 times more people employed in the small than the large scale in developing countries. So it's, a, it's a, an important component of, of developing countries' economies. Um, so that's basically the picture I wanted to paint for you before we go to Aya, who will be talking about one of the countries in this list here. So just to remember that small-scale fisheries is globally really important. It catches about the same amount as the industrial fishery or the large-scale fishery. It employs many more people, and that aspect is emphasised in these developing countries. And basically, what, I sh um, what Aya will be talking about is the vulnerability which I'll just introduce to you by this one picture where um, there's obviously, in a lot of developing countries, people rely on fish for food and income. There's a, there's a large dependence on fish. And there's a growing demand for spatial information, as we have seen, to look at vulnerability. Now, this is a vulnerability study that was done by Alison et al. in 2009. And it, it uses a method um, a vulnerability assessment to look at countries, um, uh, the vulnerability of different countries to climate change. Um, and one of the methods that you can use to look at vulnerability is sustainable livelihood analysis. It's one of a number of methods, but it's the one that we'll be using to um, look at the Philippines. I might just leave it there, yeah? And then I'll, I'll put your uh, presentation up. Mm.